I got my first ViewSonic monitor sometime in the year 2000, the PF795 19-inch flat-screen CRT. It's been so long I can't actually remember how much I paid for it, but it must have been more than $500. I don't even want to check an inflation calculator to see how much that's worth now. But it was a good monitor, and it lasted me a long time. It still works today, although it's darker than it used to be. At 640x480, the PF795 can do 180 hertz. We had some good times with Quake 3. But you didn't click on this for a nostalgic look back at an old CRT. You want to know about the new $600 ViewSonic XG270QG, a 27-inch Quad HD 165Hz monitor with proper G-Sync. This isn't G-Sync compatible, it's G-Sync. Oh, and it has a wide color gamut, much like another popular new monitor. Yes, this monitor uses the same panel as the LG 27GL850, but it has a slightly higher max refresh rate, and it includes NVIDIA's ultra-low motion blur feature, which I will definitely get to later. But let's start with the usual stuff. ViewSonic's design on these new XG gaming monitors is fantastic. The stand is metal and sturdy. Everything looks and feels solid, especially the height adjustment, which goes really high, something I complained about on the Asus VG27AQ. But the ViewSonic is in a different league than the Asus, but it should be based on the price. The XG270QG comes with wings, or anti-glare shields, if that's something you're into. More useful, though, are the two mouse bungees at the bottom of the screen. It's a good, smart inclusion. There's also a hook for headphones. But ah, RGB. Somehow, I've accumulated piece by piece a bunch of PC gear with RGB lighting. There was no design here, it just happened. But now I guess I'm just living that RGB lifestyle. The LG has two zones that are independently controllable via the OSD. And I think I need this now. Oh boy. Inputs are a bit limited, one HDMI and one display port, but that's G-Sync for you. The XG270QG includes a USB hub, headphone jack, and it does have speakers if you're in a pinch. So far, I'm really impressed with the ViewSonic's ID. Your $600 is really going to good use. But one thing I'm not at all impressed with is the OSD joystick. I spent several hours constantly in and out of the OSD when I first got the monitor, and I wanted to throw the whole thing out the window. It's too loose, but also sticks in place. It's just bad. But once calibrated, you don't need to use it that often. Speaking of that calibration, the tweaks on screen now to RGB gain are all that I needed. So let's start there. Brightness runs from 70 nits to a max of 390 nits. That's a good adjustment range, and I'm glad you can run the monitor below 100 nits. The next graph is, I'm sure, going to disappoint some. I measured an average contrast ratio of only 700 to 1. The Asus, another IPS, came in at 1100 to 1, and that does make a difference. The XG270QG does not look good in the dark, especially my sample, which I'll get into in a moment. Happily, ViewSonic offers five settings for gamma, 1.8, 2.0, 2.2, .2, etc. The screen ships at 2.2, but I prefer matching with BT1886 with a gamma of 2.4. The color performance here is using the extended P3 color space as a reference rather than sRGB. Those simple adjustments I pointed out earlier bring grayscale performance in line quite well, leading to a calibrated delta E average of only 0.9. With the white point adjusted, color checker results improve as well. In these charts, the white triangle is the screen's measured gamut, and the darker inside triangle is the P3 gamut. The XG270QG falls a little short of the extended green primary, but it's overachieving in the red. To see how much, take a look at this slide showing the monitor's gamut compared in P3 and sRGB. That red really is striking. It's deep and vibrant, and it'll most likely be the first thing you notice if you haven't used an extended gamut panel before. I'll touch on how this is achieved later on when talking about ULMB. Unfortunately, and this is a big unfortunately, there's no way to clamp the primaries back down to sRGB, so what you see isn't going to be what other people see. That's a problem for anyone doing photo or video or design work. Those folks should look elsewhere, but if you're gaming only, you can consider it a nice bit of extra saturation. ViewSonic doesn't use pulse width modulation to dim the backlight at any OSD brightness setting, so there's no worry about a flickering display causing headaches. PWM backlight dimming seems to be getting rarer and rarer, which is a good thing. The XG270QG passes as flicker-free. In my review of the Asus VG27AQ, I praised it for having a good anti-glare coating, but the XG270QG does one better. The Asus exhibited a bit of rainbow speckling at odd angles, but the ViewSonic is a bit cleaner. You're not going to fool anyone into thinking it's a glossy screen, but it's good for what it is. It might be time to ask for more, though, especially since this screen is $600. 
Apple knows the value of a true anti-reflective coating, and LG does too. Check out their OLED screens. But back to the macro shots. Take a look at the image labeled pixel structure. You can see clearly the green and blue subpixels, but the red subpixel is a bit different. Again, keep that in mind for later. Text rendering is fine. There's no half pixel funniness going on like on the BenQ VA panel I reviewed last. ViewSonic touts the XG270QG as a 10-bit panel, although because it doesn't accept an HDR signal, and there's no way to select 10-bit color, consider it as an 8-bit monitor. These gradient patches show the monitor has no trouble showing typical 8-bit gradients without banding, but I haven't yet seen a single monitor that has trouble with this. Most complaints of banding are actually complaints about JPEG compression or video compression artifacts. As we come next to screen uniformity, this is where I'm going to be the most critical, and where I'm personally disappointed the most. Full screen white uniformity is only okay-ish, with the corners visibly darker than the center of the screen. There's a little splotchiness developing as we move down to the 50% and 20% slides, but nothing egregious. That is until we get to 5% and black. The backlight bleed on this $600 XG270QG is unacceptable. I've joked about this before, but it may be that humankind's greatest engineering challenge is not to put a man on Mars, it's just to make an LCD that doesn't have backlight bleed. The top left corner of the screen is a mess, and it clouds a significant portion of the screen. The bottom edge is bad too. If you intend to purchase one of these monitors, you should have no qualms about playing the return game until you get a decent panel. But you shouldn't have to. Ugh. Okay, back to the review. Viewing angles are good, very comparable to the VG27AQ. Still much worse than a CRT, but you guys know that by now. The input lag waterfall chart shows 255 out of the 1020 measurements I take of a custom Unreal Engine game running at a VSync off 1000 FPS, looking for the fastest possible response. For the XG270QG, 2.43 milliseconds is the quickest response from the USB key press to seeing a change on screen. My best measurement for a CRT, which does no processing at all, is 1.58 milliseconds, so I only attribute 0.85 milliseconds to the ViewSonic. That's a very good result. ViewSonic offers three different overdrive modes, standard, advanced, and ultra fast. We're viewing here pursuit photos of the Blurbuster Alien taken at the max refresh of 165 Hertz. I switched over to the gray background swatches because I think it better illustrates the overdrive behavior. Ultra fast is ultra bad. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but let's switch over to a waveform graph for one of these ultra fast transitions. I'm showing here the rise from RGB 159 to 191, which is totally bonkers. The initial hit is fast, a blistering 0.6 milliseconds. So there's your claimed one millisecond response time, but it overshoots massively, only reaching the target level at 17.4 milliseconds. This transition has a CAD score of 828.1, which is only about 600 too high. But back to the pursuit photos. Standard is ship as the default mode, but I actually prefer advanced. Look at the trailing edge of the craft. Standard is pretty blurry, but advanced cleans it up nicely. There is a bit of overshoot, but that's the trade-off. And a trade-off it is. My CAT scores for standard and advanced are within five points of each other throughout the entire refresh rate range, from 60 hertz all the way to 165 hertz. Let's take a look at one transition that shares the exact same CAD for both overdrive modes, RGB 31 to 191. Standard is a bit slow to reach the target level, about 13.5 milliseconds. Advanced gets there quickly, only 3.1 milliseconds, but overshoots. At 6 milliseconds, one frame at 165 hertz, the panel can drive back down and it finally reaches the target level at 15.4 milliseconds. If you can believe it, both of these transitions share the exact same area away from a perfect square wave transition. Advanced has a bit of an oversharpened look when things are in motion, but I prefer that to the softish blur of standard. You can make that trade-off knowing neither one is really worse than the other, just different. With that in mind, let's look at my three response time charts. Cumulative absolute deviation, real response, and first response. I've used standard overdrive here, thinking that most of you would prefer that instead of advanced. First up is IPS versus IPS. The XG270QG in standard has no overshoot, so both real and first responses are identical. But check out that CAD compared to the ASUS. The VG27AQ's CAD is 23% higher. We're still not near TN, but it's good for an IPS panel. 
Here might be a better way to visualize these CAD scores for some of the monitors I've reviewed. This chart shows my CAD scores across a range of refresh rates for the ViewSonic, the Asus, and the LG 24GM79G TN panel, lower being better. The LG is the winner here, which is not a huge surprise for a TN panel, but look as its CAD rises as the refresh rate drops. The 24GM79G has no form of adaptive overdrive, so lower refresh rates get worse responses. The Asus, a G-Sync compatible display, is hovering mostly around 200 except for the elevated CAD scores around 90Hz. This occurs just past half the panel's native refresh rate of 165Hz. The ViewSonic splits the difference, maintaining an average CAD of around 170. The xd 270 qg is doing great for an IPS. To see how these response times play out, I wanted to bring out my two favorite LCD torture tests, the Gaia 3D Star Map and Skyrim. The ViewSonic has the same brightness drop as I pan and rotate the camera that other LCDs show, but this is a tough test to pass. Even TN panels aren't good enough. As for Skyrim, unlike BenQ's VA panel, where small details disappeared with every move of the camera, the xd 270 qg holds up much better in motion. Skyrim looks fine. Whee! Alright, now onto my favorite topic, backlight strobing. Given the great response times, I was hoping the monitor could do much better than Asus's ELMB, but the xg 270 qg is a little less adaptable than the VG27AQ. It can only strobe at 85Hz, 100Hz, and 120Hz, nothing else. I'm again baffled that no monitor manufacturer will allow users to strobe at 60Hz, but the TV guys are happy to give customers clear motion options at 60Hz. Disappointing. But curiously, it does have an option to limit the pulse width, which I'll look at in a bit. Let's start with the brightness animation. At an out-of-box pulse width of 100, the backlight illuminates for about 1.9 milliseconds. As I adjust the brightness, only the height changes, not the pulse width. Unfortunately, I blow out the highest measurements, but look closely at a couple of unusual things here. The on pulse has a slight upward slant, and once the pulse ends, there's a long, slow decay. More on that soon, I promise. The next animation is just to verify strobe timing. 120Hz repeats every 8.3 milliseconds, 100Hz at 10 milliseconds, and so on. Nothing wrong here. Something I haven't seen before is an option to change the pulse width. I'm pretty excited that this was included. The pulse width runs from a full 1.9 milliseconds down to a minuscule 0.2 milliseconds. The trade-off here is obviously brightness. The xd 270 qg can do 177 nits with the full pulse width, but at that tiny 0.2 millisecond pulse, it's only putting out 18 nits. Note again that long slow decay. Contrast suffers with ULMB, dropping down to a paltry 615 to 1. So how does ULMB look? No, don't adjust your televisions. This is how it actually looks. I did not turn on chromatic aberration. As a diehard CRT user, the first thing I usually do when getting a new LCD is to turn on strobing. Seeing this though befuddled me greatly. When I first turned ULMB on, every time my eyes darted across the screen, I caught red flashes around bright objects with a teal halo on the other side. It reminded me of those old DLP televisions with their color wheel. If you don't remember, those projector televisions used a color wheel to project RGB in sequence, but there was a time gap between the colors. So as your eyes panned across the screen, you'd see rainbow flashes. Or some of us saw rainbow flashes. Others had no idea what we were talking about. This video shows kind of what it looks like, although it's not entirely accurate because I'm filming a strobed display. The camera is picking up the red and teal bands though. But why is this happening with an LCD? Let's finally get back to that beautiful extended red gamut. In order to achieve this, the LG panel is using some kind of narrowband red phosphor. Potassium titanium fluoride with manganese? These phosphors, when excited with a high frequency light, emit a brilliant red in narrow bands, leading to the extended gamut. Let's go back and look at the macro shots. See how the red subpixel is obscured? I'm guessing that this is the phosphor layer but that's just a guess. The problem with these phosphors is that they have an excitation and a decay delay. This paper mentions a decay time of 4.76 milliseconds, but I think whatever LG is using must be longer. To figure out what was going on, I simultaneously measured two color patches during ULMB, one for green and another for red. Blue behaves exactly like green, so there's no need to include it. Now these patches aren't changing colors, they're fixed at green and red. Only the backlight is strobing. 
Green behaves just like a typical LCD. But as soon as the backlight pulses, the red phosphor illuminates, but slowly with a ramp. Once the backlight is turned off, the phosphor decays at first quite quickly, but there is a long and slow trail where it's still emitting. This explains the odd chromatic aberration effect when things are in motion. And this kills ULMB for me. Perhaps LG was correct in not including any sort of strobing mode in their 27GL850. Oddly, extending the color gamut hurts ULMB, a feature I personally care more about. Okay, conclusions. I'm going to be primarily comparing the XT270QG with the Asus VG27AQ, because I suspect if you're looking at this review, you've got a 27-inch IPS screen in mind. Depending upon your region, the VG27AQ can be had for as little as $380, and although I disliked how ELMB Sync, one of its highlight features, wasn't of any real use, I was otherwise overall very happy with it. The ViewSonic costs 50% more than the Asus, but it's definitely not 50% better. The XT270QG bests the Asus in response times, but at the cost of its contrast ratio. The extended gamut, while very pretty, doesn't work great for me for photo work and designing ApertureGrill.com, a website that reviews monitors. And because of that extended gamut, ULMB is plagued with red and teal flashes, like I'm stuck in some video game where I can't turn off chromatic aberration. But my biggest disappointment about the ViewSonic is that backlight bleed. I purchased this monitor, and I'm not happy about the quality control I'm seeing. Other than the panel, which is of course super important, ViewSonic is doing almost everything right with their monitor design. Just fix that OSD joystick, and maybe take Asus's panel and stick it into their beautiful stand. Now that I know you can put RGB on a monitor, I think I need RGB on my monitor. So my recommendation, based on the monitors I've reviewed so far, is to stick with the VG27AQ. That's it for this review. You can find all the charts and graphs for the XT270QG on ApertureGrill.com. Thanks for watching.